Ah, here we are again, another beautiful summer day. Nice to see uh nice to see the responses to the last one. The numbers are good. Um Continue, I want to thank you all for your, your uh, contributions to us and, 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 and the things you have to say. Uh, don't underestimate the importance of that, both in response to me and in general. Uh, Douglas M. here uh, is responding to number the last video, number 310, and he's saying, excellent observations, Paul, and wise counsel. However, I do admire Picasso for his imagination, and I question sometimes when I'm painting from life if there's any room for my imagination. What's the role of the imagination in Impressionist painting? That's an excellent question. And yet, Douglas came back very quickly and said, actually, I think I wasn't as precise as I should have been when I referred to the imagination in Impressionist painting. I should have used the term creativity. It seems to me that except for composition and perhaps the act, I'm, so, I'm sorry, and perhaps the color harmony in CS Still Life, <clears throat> there's not a lot of room for creativity in Impressionist painting. I take that to mean that you think creativity, Doug, Douglas, is um, making something out of um, nothing, making manufacturing something out of your imagination uh, in the sense of changing what's in front of you, perhaps, or something like that. Um, interesting that Impressionism is basically it's a portrayal process, right? It process, in the process of portraying the beauty of something in front of you. And... Um, no, uh, you know, it's, in one sense, you'd think of it as a portrait. You know, what are you doing uh, messing with your sitter? You know, <laughs> you had your chance. You 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 chose the sitter. You chose the location. You cho you turned the you created the lighting. You turned the the head in such and such a way and and set up the composition. Uh, now that's a tremendously creative moment. But the fact is, even before that, you created a canvas. You stretched up, you put cloth over stretcher bars and stapled them down, or whatever you do, and um, and you are you are then in the process, or at the end of the day, you will have created an object of art. So this is all created stuff. That's called creativity, right? <laughs> so I'm I'm wondering at your department, you know, why do you what what do you want? Do you want something that isn't there? What does creative even mean, right? So that's a kind of interesting question. I wonder if if we've gotten to a place today. Where we're where we're suddenly of, of a mindset that that uh, there's something lesser about impressionist painting because because it's a rendering of what's in front of us now and you'd all have to say instead of an imaginative work and in the sense of it not being an imaginative work that would be true the imaginative work is everything is done every figure is posed according to your something or other you know to your you have to have imagined how a person might look. Uh, what they might be dressing in. There's all sorts of that projection through imagination, in imaginative painting. So um, that's but but you're talking about impressionism. So what's the role of the imagination in impressionism? Is a yeah, it's a, just a gimme. That's an easy one, because it has there's there's so many aspects of it. Since your problem, uh, since your problem is is to successfully portray the beauty of what's in front of you. I'm going to suggest to you that it takes it has taken man a lot of time to figure out how to do that effectively. And I'll just walk you through some of those points that actually are what you might then talk about leaps of that require what you might call leaps of imagination. Okay? Um, so you're creating a work, so be satisfied, be glad. One of the things that the um, that is, has often been said is that we are vehicles for the arts. We're vehicles for beauty. For, you know, we are vehicles for truth. We we put ourselves in the way, especially as impressionists, of 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 bringing the beauty of what's in front of us. And really, what I say is that it's the response to beauty, but it's actually it's actually so based on beauty that you you'd think of your primary job is just render truthfully what's in front of you. Except it's also got to achieve the mission of being isolated to that which made you want to paint it. And that in itself takes imagination, doesn't it? It would be very simple to take a photograph because that doesn't take any imagination or to treat yourself as a camera because that doesn't take any imagination. So let's, let's, let's think this through a little bit with some, uh, with some maybe some other points in mind. I'm going to look uh, for, for a couple 
minutes at some things. Uh, uh, the, the first thing, um, when you're talking about the idea of the imagination, are you trying to create something new, something from nothing? Because the, um, the idea of creativity usually implies something novel. Well, if it's a solution to a problem, and the problem is how to render more effectually the beauty of what's in front of you, yeah, that's what's been going on. That's where guys like Velasquez lived, where they, where they suddenly realized they couldn't portray this thing which was inspiring them the way they had been painted, painting by the old outline into, into, into object, outline of object into form, whatever. Um, model and um, began to work with a, a, a the lost and found model or the visual order. So um, uh, so if we can leave that for a second, but what I wanted to mention just before we go any further, maybe I'll pick it up again toward the end, and that is the question of whether there are limits on our form. Are we looking to create a new form? And I'm, I'm going to suggest to you that we, we are in a particular form that historically, and that's where I try to get people not to buy into uh, sort of randomness. Just because you use paint doesn't mean it actually is in our form. It's like because you made noise, did you make music? Uh, just because you made sounds that did something to my ears, is it music? There's an application of the human imagination, if you want to call it that, into the very definition of a word like that. And so historically, what we're looking at is a form that has bounds. It's not unlimited. These are the days that want to try all the limits of everything, right? Until pretty soon nothing means anything. But this is an art form, and you either choose to live within the form, and it doesn't mean you have to be a particular type of representational painter, but if you choose to live within the form of representational painting, then you have to also discuss other things that go with the territory there, right? Because being creative is being able to live within the bounds and to, and to, and to, break, and to break through to be able to be more effective within the bounds, being more effective... In, 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 in executing uh, the stuff that makes up this form. So if the, for example, we said, we talk about painting historically, it's talked about, you know, that references uh, beauty, truth and beauty at the elevation of the human soul is always a phenomena that has historically been considered significant. And um, so there are a bunch of things you don't do, right? You don't sit around doing shocking things uh, portraying nudity with grossness. You don't do. Uh, you don't disgust the senses. Uh, you don't create chaos and confusion and call it the same form. It's not the same thing. Uh, so, if you're if you're if you're if you're interested in changing the form, you've already left the bounds of it. So you the word creative, that's a doing. It has to do with much like in science. It has to do with with being more profoundly of the form, you know, not not wanting to break out and become something this thing ain't, right? And that's the that's one of the reactions I would have I, I would have I, I would tend to want to explore uh, when in the art and art school model we're talking about creativity. It means you're creating something that never has been seen before. Well. Yeah, I mean, I, there actually is nothing new under the sun. I'd, I'd love to quote Ecclesiastes for you and say that there's nothing new under the sun. It's all been done, including the idea of, of taking painting and making whatever, make, taking a form like painting, the art of painting, this color form, and turning it into whatever, right? And uh, taking it out of this value model. Because if the form doesn't have values, then of course, if anything goes, then of course you're going to do things that have never been done before. Great for you, but you've just walked away from our form. Um, now I'm, I'm wandering on that one. So let's go back. Let's just look at some pictures here. Um, I'm going to. Uh, um, well, let me talk. I'm going to start talking about one thing. For example, staying within your form. But um, two books I have read: the Act of Creation and the book Applied Imagination. It's interesting that these books pop immediately into my head with this question when the question comes up. In the uh, Osborne book on the right, um, Applied Imagination, it's a book that was used as a text, and I believe in places like MIT, it's widely republished um, as a school text, as a college text. And um, I was interested in reading it, and I read it cover to cover. I found it fascinating that there was few, if, I don't know if there's even a single example of the use of the imagination as it applied to painting. 
right? So apply, applying imagination is a problem-solving thing, right? You're, you're applying your imagination. This whole thing about creativity implies that we're doing something else, and which really is very close to trying to create a new, a new form. And, um, but, but for example, if you're trying to, to make a better mousetrap, there's something very specific in mind and your imagination comes to work and you, eventually you create something that's not been done before. The novelty of that, right? But it's not novelty for novelty's sake. And it's not novelty for making a name for yourself. It has nothing to do with the mousetrap. It's got to be the mousetrap. So I'm back to that again. On the other one, Arthur Kessler, The Act of Creation, is also fascinating reading. Um, it gets heavy. I, admittedly, uh, Kessler being a, uh, a highly educated um, I think psychologist would be the right word for him, but uh, with other backgrounds in the um, in the in the sciences. And uh, but it's um, um, what does it say? A study of the uh, processes. Okay. Um, but so you, it's but but he uses he actually gets involved in art as a he's a, he's an art he's a writer he's a novelist um, as well as a writer in other subjects obviously in nonfiction. So you might get something out of these two things, but the act of creation is always implied that when you're creating something, it, it's a it's a it's a it's a com, it's a recombination, but it's, it maintains its unity with what the purpose was in the first place. So you can rethink that. I'll think through that that whole thing and read them. I'm just offering them really as as possible conversations for yourself, uh, your explorations for yourself. Uh, mentioning that I read them early on. Um, so, uh, um, but one of the, so so we live in a world out there when it comes to creativity. If we have, there's a world of, for example, there are laws about painting. And I, one of the ones I mentioned last week was a Picasso that looked like it was totally chaotic, and I had a, I had no possibility actually of finding any harmony. It was just noise, a lot of noise. And I've just that's my sense of that picture. You can look at it. I didn't bring it back for today. But there are laws pertaining to what we do. And I'm not talking about breaking the rules. I'm not talking about that. You're, you're, a lot of people are saying it takes imagination. In fact, I have a quote here. Before the invention of photography, you'll hardly find a picture cropped at the edge of a painting. But this kind of composition, find a figure cropped at the edge of a painting. But this kind of composition, breaking the old rules, added a sense of spontaneity and freshness to the painting. Uh, I'm going to dispute that that was even the case. I don't know wh where that idea comes up, but it's been hanging around composition for a long time. Degas is not the first. It goes to the Renaissance, and it probably goes, I know it goes into other cultures. But um, but let's just the idea of laws. You know, so you're you you have laws. You when you get done, your painting there has to have harmony. It has to be unified with itself, and it has to be interesting to look at. These are things we accept as fundamental. You know, you can call them laws or something else, but you can bore me to death. I'm not going to look. You can make harmonies all day long. A, bi a big white canvas is harmonious, but it's not interesting. I mean, it's interesting that you would call it a painting. <laughs> it's interesting that you'd even compare it to something where a man has put multiple levels of color combinations and edges and silhouettes and patterns and you know whatever, and 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 put all that mental work into the uh, actual product. But instead of being word games, um, but interesting and harmonious have always been the two. The variety and unity, you know, those are the kinds of combinations that have always been the one requisite of a good painting. And they apply, as I mentioned here, in the linear way. That has to do with shapes. That has to do with the the, the main line of a painting. That has to do with values and effects, uh, light effects, uh, value play, and it has to do with with color. The idea is to be interesting and harmonious. Not a big deal. So knowing that that's the problem, that is where your creativity is going to come from. This is what I'm going to recommend to you. Your creativity is going to come in how to do that more effectively or how to really truly do that, right? It's going to take some serious imagination. So, um, so this person was mentioning the Degas. I'll just go down and look at that for a second. Here's a Degas where you see a person on the right side of the top one being cut off here with his wheels being cut off, the back of a horse being cut off. Here you see another Degas with what if this isn't cropped funny, this part being cut off of that person's head, this part of this person's head. Oh, all this law breaking, right? Of course, it's not law breaking. It's, it's harmonious in every way you can think of. Uh, and it's interesting. 
in every way you can think of. So it's law, it's rule breaking of somebody's rules. I don't even know whose rules, as I said before, because because here's Raphael doing it. He has figures cut off at the edge, figures cut off coming in, coming out, figures all over the place. This is a um, uh, Titian, same thing. Figures c cropped off at the edges, cropped off at the edges. So this is the night. This is the Renaissance. We're already cropping figures off. So I, I, I beware the idea of living in traps that people have created for you, living in limitations that are unnecessary, that are um, that then make you want to simply break out uh, and do think about what you would do. What what makes that a law? What so there are only really ultimately in a great painting there are only two real laws, and that is that is harmony and unity. You will find one that's deprecated by some people or people insist that you can make a picture without it, and that is the, the order of effects, the order of interest, the order of... Uh, so we talk about centers of interest. We talk about that kind of stuff. You won't find good paintings that don't have some element of that, uh, an, a, sense, a sense of that this part is the dominant part and everything else is sub, subsidiary to it. It's like having a main plot and having ancillary plots, right? Having, having side plots, side... Uh, side happenings, right, that have their own little intrinsic unity, um, plots within plots and all that sort of stuff. But, um, and again, here's the one that first came to mind to me, actually, was Veronese. And um, because I, I was familiar particularly with this picture here, people cropped on both sides and uh, so on. So I don't need to, I, I, I don't know why I took so many pictures for that. But, um, so what I really do want to talk to you about, though, is creativity um, in the sense of getting... Now, one of the great power empowering things about the painters, one of the things painters want, is to somehow portray the world in front of them with more authority, with more, more effectiveness. They want, to, they want to bring more. We're all familiar with Monet, but look at the Velasquez and starts this thing. When he goes from painting what one of my uh, uh, respondents called um, a flat... A, a, a low relief painting, uh, literally, I mean, feeling like it has no depth except by the idea of, of uh, aerial perspective. Uh, and then going all the way over here to where he's creating a sense of depth, one little thing after the other, he's, he's creating this enormous sense of depth through the whole painting. Has a sense of light that doesn't exist in this one. This has got values right and everything else, but somehow or other it doesn't portray light like this one does. And by the way, I'll never swear by these by these things, but that's one of those things that they say about the Velasquez. When you see the Velasquez at the Prado, you stop looking at anything else. And it has everything to do with what you're seeing here and now. But this guy broke through for himself, and he seems to have concluded that he had to handle the drawing in a different way. In other words, you had to stop drawing outlines around things. And that is creative. That's creative imagination, right? But that's, it, it's only in the pursuit of something precisely uh, along the lines of what the main, you know, what, what the main callings actually are, the portrayal of truth in front of you. As we're talking about, as Impressionists now, right? There are all kinds of other things. I'm going to talk about Gamma in a minute, but start with that. Now, I'm showing you here uh, Monet, the two pictures on the right are Monet, the two on the left above is Jean Kine, the one below is Boudin. Now, these three guys, these, these two guys were hanging out. These were out of the Antwerp schools, and these two guys were hanging out with... Um, this guy's French, but I think he was studied in... Uh, I could be wrong about that. In, that, in any case, they, they, were, they were buddies and I think maybe mentors, uh, Boudin being, being mentored by John Kind out of the... Um, whatever the Antwerp school was. And, uh, and here's a, the guy who painted with him is Monet. And you should be able to see in these pictures that they are not after the same thing. That they 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 start out with what appears to be the same mission. I could have showed you some early Monets, but by the time you're here, Monet has changed the subject. He's now beginning to explore full spectrum color. This picture does not feel any more like a picture. It now feels like a sense of the universe in much the same way as that leap happened when when Vermeer suddenly was painting in full color or relatively speaking, full color and not living in a formulaic uh, assignment. Um, so something very different has happened here. Monet has broken through in some way. And it's, just, it's the sheer study. I, by the way, I cropped this one. Uh, forgive me, Monet. But um, uh, to make it fit better here. But, um, but his, he became a student of, of, of the life of light. 
you know, what a, 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 a full spectrum light. He became a student of that. And yeah, of course, he, by the time he was done, he had, through his imagination, an application of, of other, a recombining of information, uh, he had managed to shift all the painting to a different place. That's creative imagination. But it's all happening within a form. You don't have to leave your form. But this is all happening, by the way, also in what we may as well call Impressionism. This is all Impressionism. What the Boston School does with it is its own thing, you know, the recombining. Most of what goes on in painting is recombinations to fulfill your ambitions. That is to say, fulfill the things of, of, of beauty and truth as you see them, as you've found them, and as you want to portray them. Um, uh, as you want to be effective in portraying them. So, uh, uh, obviously the application has gone from being, you know, blotch, blotch, blotch. And by the way, I don't know where that, if that's also an innovation, but he goes from being a, basically sort of a Manet type mark maker to being a spot, spot, spot mark maker. Monet does. So that's another bit of the innovation that he's doing these guys don't appear to be doing that, but this guy is doing it. And now, so you could say, well, sure, it's because he picked up some of that stuff from the magazine, uh, the color, the color uh, printers, and the idea of using three or four colors in dot in a dot matrix to produce a more fulsome color um, uh, spectrum. But nevertheless, he's done that also. That's a shift, right? He's doing everything by the spot, by the tash, right? Is it going? Uh, uh, by the spot, 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 spot. And he's hard-pressed to do the linear stuff. He doesn't seem to be engaged in it anywhere near as much as these guys are in doing spots and articulating con continuous lines as part of a what looks like a continuity. It's a little different process. But that changing of process takes imagination. You have to be willing to get out of the box, right? So, um, but now let me just talk to you about Gamel. Uh, because this is... This is now, but again, this is not Impressionist painting anymore. So this is when you really want to talk about imagination and imaginative painting, uh, or the idea of the use of imagination. You've got to be creative in all these things. You saw the creativity of, of Monet, the creativity of, uh, of, of Velasquez. Now you're looking here at Gamel's own creativity. Let me show you this quote before I show you the hook. They say. It says, Boardman in The Hound of Heaven, um, that's a nice book you might want to get your hands on, on Gamel's particular, what his, his opus, you know, is his, his major work. Uh, he wrote that Jung's work, this is Carl Gustav Jung's work, had provided the link between myths, symbols, and poetic imagery, and the perpetually recurring emotional patterns of human life from which they evolved. Now, as a funny story that goes with that, and that is that Gamel, Gamel would uh, hang out, I guess, and he would say, he tells this on himself, but he says he would hang out at the, uh, at the uh, uh, tavern club or wherever these, all these different uh, men of different disciplines would hang out. And, and, and he would pronounce what he, you know, whatever his pronouncements were on Jung and Jung's thinking. And they would tell him he had no idea what he was talking about. You know, they'd, they'd be correcting him apparently. So, but nevertheless, what you're going to see in, in Gamel is a desire, and I'm going to call Gamel a symbolist, right? Um, he, there's many levels, but, but his desire to, to portray levels of human consciousness, sort of sometimes you get a sense that there's something real, and other times you get a sense that it's all one symbol after another. I call this the fear of, the fear of death or the fear of whatever. The fear of the of the uh, of, of the wild, and uh, but one of the things he's done, he's taken nature, and he's recombined it like a like into a collage. Now, is this borrowing strictly from modernism, or does it actually come from elsewhere? Well, you'll see similar kinds of work with people, like like um, oh, I want to say um, the Czech the Czech uh, painter uh, whose name is escaping me, Muka you know, and others, Klimt, there are other people who do some combinations like this, of sorts like this. But you see this Gamel's got this pattern running through here, this, this sort of pattern with orange in the back, in the field. And he's got this guy sort of operating in that field. He's got flames going on here, like another thing to fear. Uh, and all these, all these sort of things to fear, snake bites, bats, um, maybe it's Gamel's world of fears. But then he isolates this little thing, creates an opening here. 
in a really unusual way, right? Now, I don't know if that's breakthrough or not, but it's in the category of Gamel doing what, what I'm going to call representational painting and using it in a very imaginative way to express levels of, of, of uh, effects or to isolate effects. So you see in this painting here, he's got people hanging on spider webs and the spider's going to bite them. Is that a description of the human condition and death itself? You know, uh, but, there, but you see that by separating these things, they can, he can isolate ideas. So it's almost like he's saying that the subject is death. And I'm going to mention this, and now I'm going to go into chapter uh, three, and I'm going to talk about death this way. And I'm going to go over to this other portion of the book, and I'm going to talk about death that way. But it feels like Gamble is that kind of a, a, a guy. It's not like he's having these... these um, it's like, but I've, I've said it before, it's like he's writing a book. So, uh, And so on the same thing on this side over here, you can see he's painted you saw these odd fishy-like pattern things. They seem to represent something in and of themselves. But then there's a, there's a basic landscape here with a figure in it. Uh, something looks like a dying, injured, whatever. There's a guy with a cut in his... That looks very, very similar to one of those other round pictures. So there's this horror show of some sort going on in a real landscape. And then there's, this, there's something that's interpreting it in some way with the, uh, with the bloody crown you got to read a book to figure out what, Gamel, what the heck Gamel meant, which I think is too bad in certain ways. But on the other hand, this one is easy to understand. I think he started doing more of those where it was just, you know, you can see it as death and a human, humans, humans hung in this web in which uh, they're not their own making. They're strung out there. It's gonna get, the spider's going to get to them when it gets to them. Uh, that's sort of easy to understand. This kind of stuff I'm not sure most of us are going to understand without digging into a book somewhere and, and looking and looking. But, um, and it's especially young, probably. But so, so here's a sacrificed individual. It looks like he's been killed. And, um, and here's two other layers of things. Now, if you follow that, he says myths, symbols, poetic imagery, and perpetually recurring emotional patterns of human life. It looks like he's trying to create levels of human, of human uh, understanding. Reminds me of the, uh, the movie... Um, that came, what came out a few years ago, um, in, Inception, I think they call it, um, where, and, and I found it really intriguing, actually, that the idea of these three and five levels of human consciousness, what they did with it is very similar to what Gamel's doing with it here. But Gamel uh, is a symbolist. I mean, each of these figures, that's a symbol of something by itself. Then he uses actual symbols, like, like these, these letters here, this kind of stuff, or the key. These are actual symbols in an old school sense. Even the skein is a symbol, and um, so and so it goes. Or the here's the uh, you know here's the some here's the here's the um, the um, the uh, tool of death spear all those sorts of things. With each of these things, you see him operating on several different levels um, and de de describing several aspects. In this case, it looks almost like a continuum, right? Which is a guy struggling. This is the pre presumably the protagonist. And he's reaching toward some ideals, maybe. And then down here, he's being dragged down by his animal nature or who knows what. And uh, how the sparkles you know, on the water are being used, some of which seem to be losing themselves into the, into the waves a little bit. Um, he's underwater. It's eh, fascinating stuff. And then there's these strange symbols again um, up here that has a lot of... Uh, um, Christian imagery in it, the crown, the, uh, the uh, dove. Uh, not exactly sure what the gold thing is there, but you follow that. I mean, now what you have is you have this opportunity to, to do whatever you want, but you can see the gamble's not breaking any rules here. Gamble's creating essential centers of interest in, in all cases. He has dominant areas, and, um, and he, has, he has unified lines through them. He hasn't always operated on an S curve like this one is doing, but um, but there's a tendency, of, you know, for this for the for the great line to run in a unified way, the way all painting does, all good compositions do. And yet he's been operating outside the box through this entire phase of his training. His early stuff is fairly uninspiring, uh, routine impressionist, as it were, painted from life stuff, portraits and things. This is where Gamel actually starts really playing. And that's one of the things you, you, you're trying to do is make yourself strong in your basic skills so you can have some opportunity to, to, um, to try things.
that have to do maybe with the imagination itself. But when we say imagination here, we're talking about ideas in his imagination. And, um, and then he has to find the right figures to portray them, the right configurations, like here's another figure in a web, not a web, but being held by hands, being supported in the air by various hands. What in the heck is that, you know? But it's con he's found all these strange images to convey ideas that have to do with his. And so all one imaginative thing after another, right? And then the last part of that is the idea of the imaginative use design-wise. I mean, like, for example, you, have, you want to come up with fascinating patterns and pattern interplay and all that sort of stuff. I should have used Degas in this for some other, for some, for some, to relate back to some of that stuff. But that's where the imagination comes in. Can you make this thing interesting and can you make it hang together? It's all right there. And you're going to be spending a ton of your life just to be more interesting than the last guy. Anybody, you know, I've said before that anybody can make a pyramid. You know, the world is full of pyramidal paintings. Your job, if you make one, is to make a more interesting one than the last guy. So you already have your problems cut out for you. You're going to have to have some serious imagination to be able to do that. So, um, but let's just talk for a second about the Impressionist over here. One of the things you have to be able to do in your is, is use your imagination to perceive the world as flat. That takes imagination. To perceive the relationships of angles to each other and to other angles and simultaneously that takes a leap of imagination. You have to, you have to, you have to understand how that could be. For example, how, can you see the circle of this thing and then this circle out here? And can you see how they feel into each other? That takes imagination to do that. It even takes imagination to see color relations. It, that takes a, imagination. You have to be able to see things that aren't the things. The things are stuck in front of your eyeballs. One of the things that prevents you from working. So you have to use your imagination to get outside the box. You have to use your imagination to find different ways to use your eyes. That is here, the idea of saying, uh, looking hard at the thing you're not looking at, that took imagination for somebody, right? Uh, the very idea of relational thinking, you know, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a verbalization <laughs> of something that people realized they had to do. And then they took imagination to school themselves into being able to do those things. So this is where I would rather lean, uh, rather than saying, why should we take a slice of nature like this? Well, what, what should we do to that? Should we turn this into a dog and make him bark into the, into the wind? I mean, we're <laughs> so I'm suggesting to you when your job is actually portraying the, 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 with more and more power and truth, the beauty of what's in front of you, and, it's, and, and you're sensing there's more to it, there's more to it, and I'm not getting it. You're, it's going to take some creativity to solve that problem, to say, I'm still not there, I'm still not. What am I doing? What could I do differently? How could I recombine this thinking to make, to get myself closer to the goal, right? The mousetrap, whatever you want to call it. Well, that's the way my mind turns, Douglas, when it comes to that imaginative, imagination. When you set up a setup like this versus when you piece it all together like this one, he presumably didn't have guys standing out there. He could have. But uh, when, you pe when you piece it together, it's, admit it's true. You really do have to organize your spots, right? Recognize this is a dark picture. and You have to beautifully organize your abstractions, uh, create the patterns, create the flow of the color relation of the colors and the distribution and all that stuff. Um, and, and it takes imagination to even see that, right? To see that a picture is red, yellow, and blue, uh, or to see what the color of a picture is so that you can find the next color. It, it, it takes incredible creativity. So um, the problem is, though, the word creativity has come to mean making something has never existed before. And what we're trying to do is making something more pure, more true, more, 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 more amazing in the grand purpose of things. You know, what is the goal? What is the goal? Beauty and truth and the elevation of the human soul. So, all right, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, I could look at Degas while the, um, the fascinating ways he uses arms, just one bit of discussion, right? People are talking about, somebody was talking about him cropping figures at the edge. Well, of course, that's been done by others before. But the intriguing use of, of turning the arms into pure abstractions, you know, these elbows, these bent elbows, instead of seeing these bent elbows as a problem, he sees them as an opportunity, right? He talks this way as well. And, and so that took imagination. That's a, that's a movement in a new direction. And, and the idea of, of actually being purifying yourself to this, instead of saying, 
but I got to have the girl looking like X. But who writes the rules like that for a form that's about color and shape play, right? So, you know, so one of the rigid, one of the rigidities of our form is realism. One of the, and, and I'm not telling you not truth. I'm talking about noodling stuff up so that it looks like you know how to draw in ways that are un, unsupported by the purpose of a painting. But you can see that his proportions all look right. But you can also see that he hasn't dug in on the faces of these heads in any way. In some places, it looks they're, they're surprisingly deformed looking when you dig into them. But when you look at anything else that has to do with the distribution, the creation and distribution of color, color relations, shape and shape relations, form and form relations, uh, values, spots, and their interplay, Degas is consistently turning our heads. As Gamble said, I find, I find Degas always interesting. So that's probably the best thing I can do to you and just suggest that your hands are full. You need, you're going to need all of your imagination just to paint the truth with more power and authority. And, uh, and if you can find another, I mean, if you, have, if, you want to, if you want to promote another idea about the use of imagination, please, please, let, me, um, uh, please let me have another comment or two. All right. Well, thank you all. Um, that went on. Okay. Uh, I know it might. Uh, this has been hanging over us for a while, the idea of, of creativity and uh, the imagination and the bo how boring it is. I've said before that we are like, we are like uh, journalists, at least compared to imaginative painters. Picture, imaginative painters are like fiction writers. We are more like journalists, except it's not true. We're actually not telling you literally what's in front of you. That's realism. Our job actually is to tell you, to explain to you, to project enough of the data in front of you, like a good storyteller would, of the truth that we see in front of us, to tell you, to, to convey clearly what we saw. So you say, yeah, and then also to convey our sensation in relation to it. Um, that combination in itself takes a great bit of imagination. And the idea actually of looking at and not at a world out in front of you, and then and then putting on you know takes it, putting it putting you know re re reverting it to a piece of canvas, attaching it to a piece of canvas, um, <laughs> and engaging engaging it on a piece of canvas. <laughs> uh, that that in itself takes imagination. The idea of seeing it not as real people takes imagination. Instead of seeing it as people, you see it as color spots. The naive eye takes real imagination. So I'm saying. How good are you at this job? And, um, and, and I think you'll find that there are level beyond level beyond level of fascinating ways in which you can use your, um, your, um, uh, your now high quality uh, uh, relational skills to find things that have never been seen before and to express things in, 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 in more profound um, uh, continuities, shall we say. All right. All right, well, thank you all very much. Uh, keep the comments coming and keep the uh, sharing going on. I do appreciate all that stuff. Thank you always for your donations and uh, see you in the next one.